Shalom, everyone, and um, thank you, Abu Baker and Zelotoli and Roslyn, Jeffina, for uh, joining class. Uh, uh, we thought we'd wait for some more time for the others to join, but we'll just begin uh, with a word of prayer, and then maybe the others can join in. So can one of you please lead us in prayer, anyone? One of you please lead us in prayer, please. Let's pray, dear Heavenly Father, we come to the throne of grace in the mighty name of Lord Jesus Christ. God, God, even as we begin this class, Father, we ask your, your presence to be with us, O oh Lord, help our dear teacher to teach us, Father God, Holy Spirit, lead us, lead us. Lead our man, Father God, hallelujah, to Jesus, we pray, Father God, that whatever we are going to learn in this session, let it be for our spirit. God, help them, Father God, to be. We thank you, Daddy God, for doing this in Jesus' name. It's very Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. Uh, so we were looking at Romans chapter four on Monday. We were studying Romans chapter four. We began this chapter by just doing we'll just do us a brief recap, and then we'll move on. We began this chapter uh, by asking a question. You know, Paul asked a question, saying, "Was Abraham justified?" by works and then he quotes from the old testament genesis chapter 15 verse 6 where he says abraham believed god and it was accounted to him for righteousness so abraham received righteousness based on one thing that is he believed god and by saying this you know no one could argue with paul because this is what scripture says so paul is saying that abraham received righteousness purely by believing that it is by faith and not by works. So the righteousness that God gave Abraham uh, was by grace. And then Paul goes on to say that he did not even receive this righteousness by faith, uh, you know, uh, because he was circumcised. Yes, Lyndon, you have a question. You put your hand up. Uh, sorry, ma'am, not intentional. Sorry. Okay, okay, no worries. Thank you. Then he goes on to say that did he receive it when he was circumcised or did he receive it when he was uncircumcised? And then he says he received it when he was uncircumcised and later on he received a uh, side of the covenant, which is circumcision. Uh, or, so he says, you know, he received uh, the circumcision later, which was the seal of the righteousness of faith. So God gave him this covenant after God made him or gave him righteousness uh, through faith by grace. Okay. So the reason God gave him is so that Abraham could be the father of all who believe. It's just so beautiful how Paul just brings in all of these thoughts, how he's just, you know, using Old Testament scripture very logically, very beautifully. He's just, you know, bringing about uh, his um, thoughts uh, so that no one will argue because it is from scripture. Says, so he's saying that, you know, all will be made righteous or, you know, because, uh, you know, Abraham was made righteous by faith and so because abraham was made righteous by faith he's a father of all who believe so abraham before he had circumcision he had faith so abraham is the father of all who have faith so he's saying that you know both jews and gentiles can be justified can be made righteous before god by their faith through their faith in christ jesus and then we looked at verses 17 to 21, where the Holy Spirit is basically summarizing <clears throat> sorry, the faith of uh, the life of uh, Abraham. Or he's giving a summary of Abraham's life of faith. Okay, So we learned a few things from this. We learned that when God speaks his promises to our hearts, we need to keep two things in mind. You know, he's inviting us to believe in who he is when he gives us the promise. 
He's built, uh, he's inviting us or calling us to believe as the one who gives life to the dead. Okay, so he's a God who gives life to, to the dead. A situation may look hopeless, it might look helpless, but that's not a problem to God. But something we need to keep in mind is, you know, when God gives us his promise, he's basically calling out things that do not exist as though they were or they did. Okay, uh, it's not there, but God says it is there. So when God speaks a promise in our life or over our life, he's calling something to existence that does not exist. But he's saying, you know, this is who I made you to be. So he's telling Abraham, I made you a father of many nations. So God, for God, it was already a completed done thing. It was already completed thing in the spiritual realm. He's already made him the father of many nations, even before Abraham could even have one son of promise. So when God speaks his promise, uh, So what do we need to do? We need to join in faith. So when we say, God, you know, I'm weak, God tells us, you know, I made you strong. When, when, when you tell God, God, you know, I'm a loser, God says, I made you victorious. You know, uh, when, uh, when you say, God, I'm, uh, this is impossible in my life, God is saying, I made you to, you know, do things all things through Christ is possible and you can do all things through Christ who gives you uh, strength. So, you know, that is what we need to do. We need to join in faith with God and we need to speak uh, things um, uh, that are not and believe that are not that it exists in our lives and it will uh, come about. So this is what we looked at. Uh, till, you know, in, in verses 17 to 21. But we will look at how did Abraham journey into becoming that? How did, you know, Abraham journey into walking into that life of faith? We said that Abraham came uh, to the fullness of his faith, to the perfect faith, to the mature faith. You know, uh, uh, we saw that Abraham was not perfect in his faith. He had some weaknesses. He faltered. You know, twice he lied that Sarah was uh, not his wife, was his sister. We also saw that, you know, he didn't wait for the promised son to be born through Sarah, but he went ahead and he had Isaac through um, Hagar. So he was uh, weakened in his uh, faith. But we see that, you know, um, Paul, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Abraham came to the perfection of his faith, the mature faith. And how do we say that he came to perfection of his faith? And mature faith is, you know, when the son of promise was born, Isaac, and Isaac was a young lad, you know, almost 13 years, God tells him, take your only son and sacrifice him. And no questions asked, Abraham just obeys. Takes his son, goes to the mountain which God shows him, places the firewood, you know, places his son on the altar and is all ready to sacrifice him because he knew that God is able to bring back, you know, um, from the dead. He says from the dead, from he's able to, you know, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 19 says he received him as though he raised him up from the uh, dead. So as far as Abraham and God were concerned, it was all... It was though a resurrection had already taken place, okay? So um, as far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was as good as dead, and it was from the dead that he received him back, okay? So that is the kind of mature faith that it led him to. So Paul is saying that, hey, we just don't boast that Abraham is the father of uh, uh you know, faith, and he's our father of faith, and we follow, uh, we receive the blessings because of him being made righteous by faith, but he says we need to walk in the steps of Abraham. So beautiful, you know. Um, so look at how he's uh, so wonderfully presenting his arguments, his reasoning, and now he's telling us how did Abraham journey into becoming that? Verse 18, can somebody read verse 18, please? 
Romans chapter 4, verse 18. Can one of you please read? Romans chapter 4, verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. So the first thing that Abraham did, you know, there was, a re there was no reason for him to have hope, okay? But in spite of there was him having no reason to have hope, he had hope. Okay? But he just did not have the hope, he also believed. Okay, So hope is important and hope and believing is, are not the same things. Hope is having a desire for something, but hope is something in the future. But faith and belief is in the now. You know, it's settled in your heart. Faith is substance of things hoped for, the definition of faith. Faith is substance of things hoped for, which means I'm hoping for something, uh, but my faith is the substance of that, which means faith is the reality, the substance of what I am hoping for. That means the substance is there. It's, it's real. I can see it. I can know it. I can feel it. I can experience uh, it. So faith is a reality, the substance of what I am hoping for. So hope is way out in the future, I cannot see, but my faith is the substance of it. That means I can, I can see it, I can feel it, I can realize it, it's real. Okay, My faith is saying, I got it, it's here, and where is it? It's in my heart. Okay, So I'm believing in my heart. So there was no reason why Abraham uh, could not have such hope, but he believed. Okay, and faith and belief come uh, basically come from the same root word, so we can use it interchangeably. So we see that there was no reason why Abraham could not have such hope, but he believed. Hello, Lyndon. Can you? Thank you, Lyndon. Okay. So there was no reason why Abraham could not have such hope, uh, but he believed faith and belief come from the same root word, so we can use it uh, interchangeably. Now, if God speaks a word in your life, even if there's no reason to have hope, we must believe. Okay. And against it says against all hope, you know, Abraham believed, and that is how he became the father of many nations. Are you able to understand? Okay. Now, the second thing that we learn uh, is from verse 19. He says, he did not let his faith be weakened by considering the natural. Okay. Can somebody read verse 19, please, for us? Romans chapter 4, verse 19. Can somebody read that? And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's home. So, thank you, Subhashis. So, he says he did not let his faith be weakened by considering the natural. Yes, the natural was there. You know, uh, you could not deny it that Abraham was 100 years old, and that is a fact. And, uh, you know, it's impossible to have children at that age. But he did not let his faith weaken by considering the natural he did not focus on the natural okay so it's basically teaching us something that when we focus on the natural it tends to weaken our faith right yes or no when you look at things in the natural it tends to weaken your faith our faith, get, our faith gets weakened but we prevent our faith from being weakened by not focusing on the natural, but on focusing on God, by focusing on the promise of God, by focusing on the greatness of who this God uh, is, who made this promise, and that he's faithful to keep his promise, and that he's more than capable uh, to keep his promise, and he's more than, you know, uh, sufficient for us to keep his uh, promise, okay? 
And this is what God did. You know, uh, we read this in, we see in Genesis chapter 15, when Abraham was having one of his low times, you know, when he thought that um, he and Sarah will not have a son and it did not be from his, from Sarah's womb, uh, you know, he was considering the natural at that time. And, you know, God made him a promise. You know, God told him when he was 75 years, he would have a son of promises, 90 years you know, nothing has happened. And uh, Abraham was looking at things in the natural. And what does God do? You know, he tells Abraham, Abraham, step out of your tent. And he asks him to look at the stars in the sky and ask him to count the stars, right? And uh, Abraham says, God, I can't count the stars. And what does God say? That's how many your descendants will be. Okay, so what God did in that conversation with Abraham, he helped Abraham to take his eyes off from the natural and helped him to put his eyes on God and on his promises and that God is more than faithful to accomplish what he has promised Abraham. Okay, so if we feel weakened in our faith, you know, we need to check out on where our focus is, where our eyes are on. Okay, are you focusing on the natural? You know, when you focus on the natural, yes, things will seem impossible, some things will seem difficult, or are we focusing on the promise and the God who made the promise and on who this God is who made the promise, the greatness of God and his faithfulness and what he can accomplish and that, you know, what he says, he's faithful to do it and he will keep his word okay uh let's move on verse 20 can somebody read romans chapter 4 verse 20 please romans chapter 4 verse 20 we staggered not at the promise of god through unbelief, through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to god amen Amen. Thank you, Abu Bakr. So he says that, you know, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but the strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Okay, so Abraham did not let unbelief come in, you know. Um, so we also have a choice when God gives us a promise. You know, we can have two options, whether to believe or not to believe. But we see that Abraham did not waver in the promise of God. He had the faith, he had the belief that God would come through with his promise. And then we see that he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Okay. So the scripture does not record this for us, but you know, I can imagine, you know, Abraham saying, Father, I praise you and I thank you that you have made me the father of many nations okay says father i thank you that the seed that you have promised is mine the seed that you promised sarah and me is ours and that god you are faithful to keep your promise thank you god in advance for the son that will be born to us in this household thank you in advance that i will have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as a, as the sand on the Seashore. Now, all this is not written in scripture, but he it tells us that he gave glory to God. So, what does it basically mean? Giving glory to God is basically be praising God for who he is, what he can do, what he's able to do, giving him thanks and praise. Now, when did Abraham give glory to God? Gives him the glory before all of these promises happened. He sees us in reality, it happens in reality. Before all this happened, he gives glory to God. So, you know, Paul is saying all this is the steps of faith. And this is the journey of faith that we journey along, even as we follow uh, our father of faith, who is Abraham. Okay. And then he says, uh, you know, uh, can somebody read verse 21, please? Verse 21. And being fully that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. 
Amen. So being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So Abraham came to that place of full convinced uh, faith that was fully mature and perfect. He came to that place of being fully convinced of the promise of God, that what God had promised, he will perform. He is faithful to perform. He's capable to perform. He is more than able to uh, perform. So verses 17 to 21 is a very beautiful summary, you know, of Abraham's journey of faith. And, you know, it has some very key important things that he did. Um, and, you know, some things that we can learn, we can follow, we can imbibe in our own uh, lives, how we can walk in this life of faith and, and how we can come to this place of mature, perfect faith okay so just so beautiful how paul just uh, you know brings it all for us and just places it that uh, in front of us so that you know we can learn we can um you know receive for ourselves and we can also grow and follow in the steps of abraham and be mature and perfect in our faith okay we'll move on to verses 22 to 25 before that anyone has any questions any questions? Okay, uh, we'll move on to verses 22 to 25, righteousness by faith in Jesus. So can one of you please read verses 22 to 25, please? And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Amen. Okay, amen. So in verses 23 to 24, you know, the story of Abraham is not just for him, but it's also for us. Okay. Um, but it's also because God is giving us righteousness through faith. And Paul then points out to Jesus. Okay. So what is Paul saying here is he's saying he was crucified for our sins. He was crucified for our wrongdoings, our wrong, our wrong actions, our sinfulness that Christ was crucified. And he says he was raised because of our justification. Okay, which means the right, the resurrection of Jesus, sorry, the resurrection of Jesus is a pronouncement of our justification. Now, when Jesus was resurrected, it means that, you know, that the, the work of God, the redemption plan of God, the salvation plan of God was complete. Okay, so resurrection is not just Jesus dying on the cross that the whole plan of salvation was complete, but resurrection actually uh, proves that the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross was satisfied uh, the penalty for sin, satisfied this God who is just, who uh, looks for uh, justice in sin, it justified uh, our sins. It, you know, it it um, it paid the perfect price for our sins, and God the Father was satisfied, fully satisfied with the uh, with the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. So resurrection is very very important, as important as uh, crucifixion, because if there was no resurrection, it means that what Jesus did on the cross you know, was not a full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice. It did not please or satisfy. It was not a complete um, offering that, uh, you know, satisfied this God who is just, a, 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 a God of justice. Uh, but we see that the resurrection of Jesus is a pronouncement of our justification. So after, you know, uh, the resurrection is that we are justified or made righteous in God's sight. So the resurrection of Jesus, it is attesting to the fact that we have been made justified, that we have been made righteous. That means, yes, 
that, you know, to be made right in God's sight, there was a price that had to be paid and we could not pay that price. That price was very great and big. And when Jesus paid it on the cross, when he was resurrected, you know, that's the that proves to the fact that we have been justified, which means with the resurrection of Christ, the case was closed. Our case was closed. You know, uh, we were acquitted. We were declared as not guilty before the Father because the penalty for our sins was uh, paid. So you can imagine it as this. You know, you can imagine yourself standing in a court um, as a criminal, each of us, you know, standing in the court of law, we are criminals and we have been proved to have done things that have wrong. Um, a charge has been brought against us and, you know, um, we have been proved as people who have done something wrong, you know, we are criminals and there is a punishment and we have to pay to say, you know, 50,000 rupees or 50 lakhs or whatever for the wrong that we have done. And someone walks in with a receipt and that says, you know, this five lakhs, this 50,000 has been paid for this person. And the judge has no other option but, but to say that you are free. Case is dismissed. The case is closed. They set free. So this is what happened when Jesus resurrected from the dead. You know, it's the proof that you know, the, the punishment for our sin pleased the heart of God. Was, it was fully satisfied. He was fully satisfied with the, uh, the payment for our sins. And that's when we were acquitted. That's when we were declared as not guilty before God, which means that's when we were declared as being justified, as being righteous in God's sight. Okay. So when we were pronounced free, Christ's resurrection took place or Christ's resurrection is the announcement of our justification. It says he was raised because of our justification. That means resurrection is the announcement of our justification. So you see how important resurrection is. You know, if Christ had not resurrected from the dead, we wouldn't have been made righteous. We wouldn't have been justified. So no more worrying about the charges that are leveled against us because Christ has been raised from the dead, which means he has pleased the heart of God, has appeased the heart of God, and this just God is pleased in the peace with the sacrifice that has been made. Okay. Now, having spoken about Abraham's faith, uh, uh, now he's, you know, Paul is changing his attention or moving on, uh, focusing his attention to Jesus. He's changing the focus to what Jesus Christ did in order to justify us. Okay, so in chapter five, the focus is on Christ and what he did, uh, the grace of God and the righteousness by faith. And he's putting all this together in the person of Christ. So he's talking about faith, he's talking about righteousness and grace in the light of what Jesus has done for us. Uh, in chapter 5, okay? So that is uh, chapter 4, very beautiful uh, passage of uh, scripture, uh, so beautiful that we learn so many things and how beautifully Paul just brings about uh, the life of Abraham um, and, uh, you know, his life of faith and how he walked in faith and how we can, you know, walk in the steps of faith of um, Abraham, which is very beautiful. Okay. Anyone has any questions? Chapter four? Any doubts? Anything that you want to ask? No? Online students? Okay, there are no questions. We'll uh, move on to chapter five. So uh, we'll just read chapter five. Um, so can you know, a couple of us read a few verses. Uh, chapter.
Okay, can uh, we all read chapter five? So even as we read chapter five, you know, I like you all to just, uh, you know, share at the end after reading, you know, um, if there's something that God spoke to you, uh, some, you know, verses, phrases, um, or a verse that you just let out of scripture and spoken to you. Maybe something that you read in the past, God has taught you, you can share with us, uh, even as we look at chapter 5. Okay, so we'll all uh, turn to Romans chapter 5. And like like all of you to read a few verses, please. So there is totally uh, 21 verses. So each of us could read three or four verses, that'd be great. And then uh, we will just share, you know, what God spoke to us, even as we were reading it, or some, you know, was just slept out at us, spoke to us in the situation that we are in, or a rhema word that we received, or something that you learned in the past when reading Romans chapter 5, you can share with us, okay? So can someone begin reading Romans chapter 5? Maybe you can read four or five verses. We can take turns, please. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Amen. Thank you, Zelory. Uh, can Verse 6 to 10. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a not righteous man we won't die. Yet, for adventure, for a good man, some we won't dare to die. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath to him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abu can somebody else read verses 11 to 15? We have two more people read uh, 11 to 15, and somebody else can read from 16 to 21, please. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin, for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Supashish. Can somebody else read from verses 16 to 21, please? Um, okay, so 
and and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification for if by the one man's offense that ring through the one much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will ring in life through the one jesus christ therefore as through one man's offense judgment came to all men resulting uh, resulting in condemnation even so through one man's righteousness righteous act the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of life for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one's, one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Wherever the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reign in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Zedatoli. So, just open up this time for any of us to, any of you to share, you know, anything that God spoke to you through these verses, anything that, you know, read, you read before or God had spoken in the past, like share from these verses, or in just to see the rhema word, something that really touched your heart, you can take some time to share, please. Anyone? That's yeah. So um, I like two things in this whole chapter. Uh, in the first part, we see in verse, verse 5 that now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured in our hearts. So uh, that's one of the world I always hold on to, that uh, he will never disappoint me, uh, one of the hope that I have. And uh, even that helps me to understand, even if I'm disappointed in life, it's not a disappointment from God. It's just the plan of God. And in the end, it, and the why we don't get disappointed is because the love of God has been poured. In. Ultimately, it's all about the love of Christ and that I believe that's what keeps revealing more and more as we keep reading the scripture. And uh, uh, in verse 12, uh, from verse 12, it's like a master plan of God. <laughs> like uh, one through one man sin entered and through one man uh, salvation came i still remember reading this for the very first time i was in my aunt's home and i was just wondering about the mind of christ uh, mind of god how how big it is how awesome it is that he planned everything from the beginning uh, one man sin will enter and from one man i'll give a salvation and that just makes me wonder like how he plans things and that gives me a great hope like if he if such a god who planned all these things has a plan for me it will always be the best so yeah amen thank you jepina thank you for sharing anyone else we have more people share please okay i just want to uh, share a little bit um uh, well, I was reading um, verse 3, like it says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. You know, it was um, uh, through the word tribulation, it just reminded me uh, of uh, when I was 13. I was very young, uh, like a new in faith, and in my family, I was the first to encounter the presence of God. You know, like we are from Christian background, but um, my parents were also nominal Christian, and I came from such a background. It, it was very uh, dysfunctional, uh, dysfunctional family. So, like as I encountered God, you know, um, as I went to the fellowship churches, you know, my parents used to complain, "Why you always go to church?" Something like that, and it really discouraged me. And you know, like it wasn't uh, that kind of persecution, but you know. Like it was such a uh, trials, uh, it was such a uh, difficult uh, time for me. But you know, as I continue to preserve her, and you know, slowly uh, the Lord started to develop in me 
And, you know, over the years, I see the hand of God over my family. And most of my family members are born again believers by the grace of God. We have been praying and God is working in my family. So, yeah, it really encouraged me. This verse, you know, really used to encourage me and remind me the faithfulness, the goodness of God over my life. Amen. Thank you, Zella Todi. Thank you for sharing. That's uh, beautifully. So, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Um, I just like to share uh, a verse from verse three as well. Says, but we also glory in tribulation. You know what glory means? Basically, praise. Uh, you know, it, it 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 just means take you know beauty, uh, you know, credit. Just praise. We don't see tribulation or difficulties as uh, as due to something beautiful. Uh, we don't praise uh, the difficulties that we go through. We we are struggling, we are grumbling, we are murmuring, we are complaining. Uh, but the word of God says, hey, take glory in tribulation because, you know, uh, there is a, a, a good thing that is coming out of it. There is something positive, you know, it is going to produce perseverance. And I, I uh, you know, know that perseverance is so important for us in our, in our walk with uh, uh, God because, you know, any there are so many things that comes in our life, so many difficulties, so many challenges that you know we can fall out on our faith, we can go away from God, we can be disappointed, we can be angry with God, uh, but uh, we can even give up on ministry. We can you know go do things, um, but you know perseverance is so important to hold on. Uh, to what God has given to us. And that's what even Paul says, you know, I take hold of what God has taken hold of me and I continue to run my race with perseverance, with endurance, fixing my eyes on Jesus. I love that that verse because, you know, you're, you, when you take hold of what God um, takes hold of you, sometimes it's difficult to, to give up that hold, let go, to, uh, you know, uh, but it's so important to persevere and perseverance is what is more important uh, because God is not looking at who finishes a race first, but God is looking at who perseveres, who perseveres, who endures. And, uh, you know, um, looking at all the past years of my life, you know, seeing how faithful God was in helping me to persevere, to endure through all the challenging times, the difficult times, it just built my character, it just built my hope my trust and my faith in um, God. So, uh, and it's also a reminder for me this morning that, you know, just take, give praise in tribulations and in, in difficulties. Yeah. Anyone else likes to share? Okay. No? Okay. If, um, if it's no, we'll just end class today. We'll maybe begin uh, Romans chapter 5. We'll begin studying it uh, uh, from um, next um, week, from Monday onwards. So we can look at Monday and Friday together and finish Romans chapter 5. Anyone has any other thoughts, questions, anything you'd like to say before we end class? Okay. There's nothing, okay, we'll end class here. Uh, thank you all for joining class today. Uh, have a blessed evening and I'll meet you all on Monday. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Zeratoli.